Okay, it is Friday. Yes, Halloween. It's a three-day weekend. I won't see you again for five days. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yeah. I feel the same way. <laughs> no, that's not true. I love you guys. I really do. I'm joking. Uh, let's see. We are a little bit behind, and so that we have really two options. We can either go faster, or we can do a song. Okay, that's what I thought. So, where are we? Let's see. All right. So, the song we're going to sing is, I try to make the songs relevant, and this song is about... Um, a very, very important electron carrier, and it's to the tune of an old Beatles song called Penny Lane. It's not real easy to sing, but that's never stopped me, and I hope it will not stop you. Okay? It's called NAD. In the catabolic pathways that our cells employ, oxidations help create the ATP. While they lower Gibbs free energy, thanks to enthalpy. If a substrate is converted from an alcohol to an aldehyde or ketone, it is clear. Those electrons do not disappear. They just rearrange. Very strange. NAD is in my ears and in my eyes. Helping molecules get oxidized. Voila, NADH, yeah. And the latter is a problem anaerobically, cause accumulations of it muscles hate. They respond by using pyruvate to produce lactate, which the citric acid cycle, which the Cori cycle handles transhepatically. I came in my cycles. Synthesizing sugars almost effortless, using gluconeogenesis. Anabolically, eagerly, NAD is in my ears and in my eyes, helping molecules get oxidized. Voila, NADH. That's it. Okay. A simple one. Now, no, no. Now, maybe we're behind, but hopefully we feel a little bit better, right? So. Okay, so um, being behind is not a problem. I will speed up or something, I don't know. All right, so we're getting ready to talk about electron transport. And of course, I've set the, the, the stage for it by talking about the mitochondria, the mitochondrial structure. And so what I want to do here is dive into the actual process. You probably have seen this in other classes. Uh, we're going to talk about it at a little bit deeper level, probably than you've seen in some classes. Uh, and it's important to keep this in mind. Now. I like to show this figure to start everything off because it makes the problem look a lot worse than it really is. All right? So let's think about what has to happen. So along glycolysis and the citric acid cycle, we've been producing reduced electron carriers. Those reduced electron carriers include NADH and FADH2. And you've been, I've been talking on and on almost incessantly about the fact that we've got to recycle these guys back to NAD and FAD. So what the electron transport system is going to allow us to do is to recycle those back. So what's going to happen in the electron transport uh, system is that NADH and FADH2 are going to drop off their electrons and protons and become NAD and FAD. Now, in order for this process to happen, it is essential that electron transport be working. That is, that the protons won't get dropped off if the electron transport system is plugged up. And we'll see, not today, but we'll see later how the system can get plugged up. So I want to emphasize that. That's part of something that's very important control in metabolism. Because if electron transport system gets plugged up and we're not recycling NADH and we're not recycling FADH2, the first thing that's going to happen is the citric acid cycle is going to stop in its tracks because it needs NAD and FAD. Okay. Well, like I said, I show you this figure because it makes the problem look a lot worse than it is. I'm going to step you through it, and then I'm going to show you an easy way to do it. All right? So NADH comes 
um, into the electron transport system and dumps its electrons off at NADH oxido at NADHQ oxido reductase. And by the way, I wouldn't recommend writing this down while I'm saying it. You'll see why in a minute. Okay? NADHQ oxido reductase dumps its electrons off to an enzyme or to a molecule called coenzyme Q, labeled here as Q. Coenzyme Q can also accept electrons from succinate Q reductase. And you can see it is a uh, sort of a gathering point for electrons from either FADH2 or ultimately from NADH. Coenzyme Q dumps its electrons off onto Q cytochrome C oxidoreductase, which in turn dumps its electrons off onto cytochrome C, which in turn dumps its electrons off onto cytochrome C oxidase, which dumps its electrons off onto oxygen. Now, if there's one thing out of this cycle at the moment you want to write down, it is that electrons coming from NADH and or uh, succinate Q reductase, which we'll talk about, which, which, is wh which is where the FADH2 comes in, they dump off their electrons, ultimately ending up on oxygen and making water. So electrons in the electron transport system end up on oxygen, which is the terminal electron acceptor when they gather those electrons and, they get, and the, that oxygen gathers protons, we make water. So water is the final product. Okay? You feeling a little bloated? Maybe you're just doing too much electron transport. You know, have you thought about that? Maybe not. Now, this is too complicated. This is dumb. All right? This is dumb. And in fact, most books don't even bother with doing this because everybody has different names for these. And the, the different names make this process very, very easy to remember. And we're going to use the easy to remember things because you've got enough things to remember that are hard to remember. NADH dumps its off, electrons off onto this guy right here. And this guy right here we call complex one. Simple. It starts at complex one, at least for NADH's electrons. Yes, you should know complex one. FADH2 actually is over here. It dumps its electrons off onto this thing right here, the succinate Q reductase. And guess what? We call that one complex 2. Okay? This guy is the same as the enzyme, the succinate dehydrogenase we talked about in the membrane of the mitochondrion in the citric acid cycle. Same thing. Complex 2. All right. Q is already short enough. It's kind of hard for us to make that any shorter or simpler. So we'll just call that Q or CoQ. All right? I'll let you guys tell me what we should call this. Complex 3. Okay? And that's what we'll call it. This is complex 3. Cytochrome C doesn't have another name. It's still called cytochrome C. So we've got a Q and we've got a, a cytochrome C. All right? And down here, of course, we've got complex 4. So that's the flow of electrons. Now. We see entry points for both uh, electrons, for both FADH2 and from NADH. And by virtue of the fact they come in at different places in the cycle, we will see that there's different amounts of energy that's generated as a result of the movements of electrons through these. The movement of electrons through these complexes is generating potential energy. Underline that. Okay? The movement of electrons through the complexes is generating potential energy. We'll see what the form of that is in just a minute. Okay, now, you see volts on the side. We're not going to worry ourselves about oxidation reduction potentials. If you're curious, I will just simply tell you that we measure the potential, that is the uh, voltage, as it were, of, of an individual complex. And complexes that have a more positive value will take electrons away from those that have a more negative value. So literally, this guy is sucking electrons down this way. Okay? Literally sucking electrons down towards oxygen. Okay. This, I think, is a better representation of what's actually happening. So what you see on the screen is the uh, representation of the mitochondrion. Inside the mitochondrion is down. Outside the mitochondrion is up. And where it says intermembrane space, remember we've got an inner mitochondrial membrane shown here, and we've got an outer mitochondrial membrane. So the, in, the intermembrane space is that space between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. So this is the matrix. This is outside the mitochondrion, or outside the, the inner mitochondrial membrane. 
All right, so here's what you just saw. Citric acid cycle generates NADH. It generates FADH2. This, is, uh, this makes it look like electrons go from complex one to complex two, and that's not right. As you saw in the previous figure, this should have, should have made a sort of loop around there to coenzyme Q. They both go into coenzyme Q. Then electrons go to complex three. They skip cytochrome C, for which for reasons I don't quite understand, and then ultimately go to complex four and then to oxygen to make water. Now, this figure also shows how the potential energy is actually generated. Because you can see as you look of the movement of electrons through complex one, complex three, and complex four, that protons are being removed from the matrix out into the intermembrane space. Remember, we're making a concentration gradient and we're making a charge gradient. It's going to be more positive out here than it is in here. We're going to have a higher concentration of protons out here than there is in here. That's potential energy that can be used to do something. And what we'll see in oxidative phosphorylation is that that potential energy is used to make ATP. It does not happen in the, in the electron transport system. All that the electron transport system does is it makes the potential energy. You can think of the electron transport system as charging the battery. We're charging the battery. And then we make the battery do something in oxidative phosphorylation. OK, questions about that? I'll tell you a little piece of trivia. One piece of trivia is right here. Coenzyme Q. We'll see how this, this works in just a minute. Um, but coenzyme Q plays a critical role in this process. Electrons coming from NADH or from FADH2 come in pairs. Two electrons. So when NADH dumps off its electrons, it dumps off two electrons. When FADH2 dumps off its electrons, it dumps off two electrons. However, complex three complex or cytochrome C and complex 4 can only handle one electron at a time. One electron at a time. That means that there has to be something, and I like to call it a traffic cop. This guy's a traffic cop. It accepts two electrons and it passes them off one at a time. Another common question I get out of this figure is well, where do those protons come from? Okay. Did something have to give up those protons for those protons to be there? And the answer is no. Remember, we're talking about an aqueous solution. We're talking about approximately pH 7. And at pH 7, you've got 10 to the minus 7th molar protons already there in any solution of water. So there's protons there that can be moved. We're going to move the protons out. That's going to cause the pH to drop up here and cause it to increase down here. So we'll see it. A, a concentration gradient of protons, and we'll see a charge gradient across that membrane, both of which will help us to make additional um, ATP. OK. This figure simply shows us, and now there's nothing on here that you really need to memorize for, for an exam or anything, but I, do, I, I show it to you to illustrate the complexity of these complex. There's complex one right there, 46 proteins in complex one, okay? This is, when they say complex, they're not exaggerating, okay? It really is a complex. It's the most complex of all the complexes, but even the simplest, succinate, uh, the, the complex two has four proteins in it. Complex three has 11, complex four has 13. Over here we see the groups that are involved in transferring those electrons or carrying those electrons, okay? So we see flavins. When you hear about flavins being important, FAD stands for flavin, adenine nucle uh, dinucleotide. Flavins carry electrons. So FMN is a flavin mononucleotide. We see FES, FE of course being iron. These early proteins here are called iron sulfur proteins because they have iron bound to sulfur and they participate in that electron transfer. The remaining guys are known as hemes and or cytochromes. Okay? So cytochromes are proteins that contain a heme group, basically. Cytochromes are proteins that contain a heme, and you've seen heme before in hemoglobin. 
It's a big ring complex. It's got an iron in it. And that iron now, instead of carrying oxygen, as we saw in the um, uh, hemoglobin, is carrying electrons in the electron transport system. All of the cytochromes, and the cytochromes start right here, all of the cytochromes contain iron except for these guys down here in complex four. Instead of having iron, they have copper. And I'll say more about that. Okay. Now, there are things that are known as electron transport inhibitors. Okay? They're useful in a couple of respects. Some of these function very nicely as natural insecticides. Okay? Rotenone is a compound made by plants to kill insects. So you can buy it at an organic, at an organic um, garden shop. You can buy some rotenone. It's actually an insecticide that's organic. It's made by a plant. Spray it on your, on your uh, tomato plants to keep the bugs from eating them, and you're set. The way it works is it blocks movement of electrons through complex one. So rotenone blocks the movement of electrons through complex one. And by the way, you notice I'm talking about electrons, and I'm talking about protons. They're doing very different things. Don't confuse them. Electrons move through the complexes. Protons get pumped by the complexes. So the electrons are the energy source for the proton pumping. Electrons are the energy source for the proton pumping. <clears throat> OK. So you see another compound up here called amital. Amital is also uh, an electron transport inhibitor. It also inhibits the movement of electrons through complex one. And you might say, well, rotenone, that must be a poison. It must, it must kill us, right? Why do we put that on our tomato plants? And while I wouldn't recommend going out and putting it on your cereal, probably not a good idea, okay, it's not as poisonous as some of these other things. And the reason is because, let's imagine right here, I block complex one, I can still get electrons in via complex two. I've got an end around. Right? In insects, this is a little bit different setup, and there's a different problem. We'll actually talk about insects later when we talk about insect muscle. Okay? But that's more of a problem for insects than it is for you or I. If we look at complex three, com movement of electrons through complex three is blocked by antimycin A. This guy's more poisonous. This isn't something you probably want to mess with. There are ways around it, none of which we're going to talk about here. There are ways around it, but they're not very easy. This guy's a more severe poison than these guys are. Now, the most poisonous things on here block comp movement of electrons through complex four. No surprise, there's our buddy cyanide. Okay? This is known as azide, N3 minus. And here's our friend carbon monoxide again. We've seen carbon monoxide gets you two ways. It gets you in your hemoglobin because it can displace and replace oxygen, and it can stop electron transport. Carbon monoxide is not something you want to mess with. Now, if you block right here, everything plugs up. You might say, well, they flow here, 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 here. Okay. Well, yeah, they do, but they, if they don't make it past here, then this guy starts plugging up, then this guy starts plugging up, and this guy starts plugging up. And ultimately, when we, when we do this, the whole system stops. And what happens when the whole system stops? NADH cannot transfer its electrons. FADH2 cannot transfer its electrons. And the citric acid cycle is going to stop. Okay. So now you see a connectedness between the movement of electrons through electron transport and the citric acid cycle. Yes, sir. By attaching to the heme group? Yeah. yeah, that's a good question. I believe it does, but I don't know the exact mechanism in complex four. I, I can't tell you that for sure. But it wouldn't be surprising that it would do that because you know it has affinity for the iron uh, in the heme group. Okay. Um, so those are inhibitors. Inhibitors are very useful tools in the laboratory for measuring how much energy is generated. We can actually isolate mitochondria in the laboratory and then block them with some of these things and study 
how much energy is generated when they're blocked. So that's, that's a useful structure. Okay, I'm going to show you a couple structures, neither of which you're responsible for. Just show them to you so you know what's there. These are quinones, and quinones are the molecules for which coenzyme Q gets its name, the Q. The Q comes from the quinone. The quinone has a long hydrophobic tail, which allows it to stick in the membrane. This part sticks out of the membrane a little bit. And what you see is that this guy is capable of accepting one electron or two electrons and then passing them off one at a time. That's what this figure is trying to show you. That's the traffic cop function of coenzyme Q that I talked about before. Accepting two electrons and then passing them off one at a time. Okay. Flavins, you've seen these before. This is a flavin mononucleotide, and the flavin part is this flat ring structure up here. And again, we see this is how we're making the FADH2. There's the two electrons and two protons. You're not responsible for structure, but you can see that we've changed from this structure over here to this structure over here. There's the two protons, and instead of having two double bonds, we now have one double bond, meaning we've gained electrons. Iron sulfur compounds. Iron sulfur compounds are really surprisingly complicated. Okay? Surprisingly complicated. They can exist in a lot of different geometric forms. Notice how iron is being complexed by the sulfur side chain of cysteines. Okay? And we see this can be in a variety of geometric forms. Here's one iron, here's two irons, here's a complex of irons. And there's many other combinations that can exist for iron sulfur proteins. Okay? So that's a, uh, just an interesting sidelight about the chemistry of um, iron and iron sulfur compounds. Okay. Now, what I want to do is um, sort of think up close and personal about what's happening in the individual complexes. So if we look at the individual complexes, what we're looking at here is complex one. And no, I'm not going to hold you responsible for what's in here. But I want to sort of talk you through it just so you can realize what's going on. And remember that we're talking about a complex that has 46 proteins in it. And only the grand sum of two electrons are passing through it. Which means that these proteins, some of them carry electrons, some of them don't carry electrons, but they may support proteins that are carrying electrons. There may be passing of uh, electron to complex to complex to complex to complex to complex before it finally gets out of the complex one. I shouldn't say complex, but call this from protein to protein to protein to protein to protein before it gets out of complex one. All right, And we're not going to go into those individual roles, so don't worry. But looking at it schematically, what we see is uh, that we have um, um, NADH coming and dumping off its electrons. We're looking here in the matrix of the mitochondrion. Notice that NADH has to be in the matrix. I'll remind you later of that. It means if we're, going to, if we're going to dump electrons off from NADH, we have to get NADH into the matrix. And though the citric acid cycle puts its NADH in the matrix automatically, glycolysis does not do that. Remember, we made NADH in glycolysis. And if we want to use those electrons, we've got to get that NADH in. That'll be a problem later we'll talk about. Anyway. NADH in the matrix dumps off its electrons. The electrons pass through several proteins, which are iron sulfur proteins. Ultimately, those electrons are dumped onto coenzyme Q. It gains the electrons, and when it gains it, we write it with a QH2. Before it's gotten those electrons, it's a Q. So again, it's picking up two electrons at this point, and QH2 is in the membrane. Remember, because of the fluid mosaic model, these molecules in the membrane can move. And so Coenzyme Q is moving around, bumping into other things in the membrane. When it bumps into a complex three, it's going to, to don donate its electrons. And we'll see how that happens next. Okay. This is the structure of uh, complex three. Um, and um, there uh, are, within these iron sulfur centers, like we saw in the other one before, that's not too, uh, of too much importance. We also see that complex three has the first heme groups in cytochromes that we, we've uh, seen. Okay, so complex three has both 
iron sulfur proteins and heme proteins. But more importantly, what happens in complex three is a cycle that we refer to as the Q cycle. The Q cycle okay, works like this. So I want you to remember with that last or a couple slides ago where I had the QH2 that was being made. So QH2 is coming from the um, uh, complex one or complex two. The same thing happens in complex two where the Q is getting two electrons. This Q pool simply means that we have QH2. It's reduced coenzyme Q. It's got electrons, it's got protons. All right. Now, the Q cycle tells us how these electrons actually move through complex three. And so I'm going to go through that in a little bit of detail. If the process starts with the movement of electrons in, okay, the electrons coming into the complex, and there's our QH2, that's our coenzyme Q with the electrons, and it does a divide and conquer approach. Okay? Coenzyme Q dumps one electron off to cytochrome C, which is docked on the complex three. So it's docked. It's actually touching complex three. There's cytochrome C. Remember, cytochrome C can only handle one electron at a time. There's the electron. The other electron that, cytochrome, that, that coenzyme Q was carrying is transferred to another Q that is being held inside of complex three. So we've got a Q coming in, we've got a Q that's already there, and this Q that's already there did not have any electrons on it. So to account for our electrons, two electrons, one goes to cytochrome C, one goes to an oxidized coenzyme Q to get a Q with one electron on it. Everybody with me so far? Now, cytochrome C, of course, has gotten its electron so it gets, out, it gets out of the picture. It's now going to take its electron and go pass it on to complex four. So it leaves. Cytochrome C is going to leave. Meanwhile, the thing I haven't accounted for were these two protons. I've talked about the two electrons. What happens to the two protons? Okay. The two protons are dumped, and unfortunately in this figure, up is into the matrix. Okay. Into the matrix is up. All right. What happens is this guy, Dump, the, the, the two protons that were here are just dumped into the matrix. So we've already seen that we've had two uh, protons that have moved from here up to here. Now, we've only done half of the cycle. Okay? The other half of the cycle, remember we still have this guy down here that's got one electron, right? We've got to get this guy ultimately back to no electrons. Right? And so what we do is another Coenzyme Q comes in. Another coenzyme Q comes in. The other coenzyme Q comes in, and it does exactly the same thing the first coenzyme Q did. It divides and conquers. So it transfers an electron to a new cytochrome C. We've had a new one come in in the meantime. And it transfers the other electron to the, to the Q that had one electron on it. Okay. And this guy grabs two protons out of here. We have a QH2. Guess what this guy's going to do? It's going to go back and join the pool. And a new oxidized Q is going to come in. This QH2, um, I'm sorry, this QH2 becomes Q. It goes out here and, of course, can come back in as an oxidized Q over here. So what's happened overall? We've had two coenzyme Qs come in. We've made, uh, we've made a total of two cytochrome Cs. We've made one coenzyme Q. So we've only done one net coenzyme Q. Two came in, one goes out. Okay? And we are, um, uh, we've moved four protons into the matrix. Protons came from coenzyme Q. Now, this figure is always confusing, and I see on your faces, I see the confusion, so I'll stop for questions. Jenny? I mean, out of, I'm sorry, I think in the matrix. You're right, moving them out of the matrix, moving them out. Sorry. Sorry. 
No wonder you have that look on your face. <laughs> Moving out of the matrix, I'm sorry, matrix is down here, outside is up. So I, sorry. I said, that, I, I said it completely backwards, so now that everybody's totally confused, all right? So, so the protons are coming from the matrix and going to the outside down. Yeah. Does that make more sense? I'm glad I'm not taking a test today. You guys would have, I would have failed it probably. And I would have gotten no mercy from anybody here either. Can I get partial credit? Jessica? The, so the Q pool, remember we've got millions of coenzyme Qs in the membrane. So that could come from FADH2, come from NADH, there's, you, there's no way of telling. Yeah. Yes, Megan. Um, is the Q pool like a structure or no. is it an accumulation? It's an accumulation. So as I said, in the, in the membrane of the cell, uh, of the mitochondrion, first place, we're going to have thousands of complexes, one, two, three, four. We're going to have thousands of coenzyme Qs, and we're going to have thousands of cytochrome Cs. So the pool simply refers to the collection of all of them. And some of them are going to have a QH2. They're going to have two electrons and two protons. Some of them are going to be Q, which is, and so the Q pool is simply represented by all of those possibilities. Does that make sense? OK. Did I, yeah. Yep. So isn't that three protons here? Say it again now. So one proton is coming from the QH2 from the Two protons from QH2 are going right there. Okay, it's going out, but yep. it's not coming down to So these protons are coming from the matrix. Okay? Okay, well let me step through the process real briefly and then, I, then uh, I'll, I'll move on. So real briefly, okay, what we have, the main thing that happens is divide and conquer. Two electrons, two protons come in, they split. One goes to cytochrome C, one goes to Q. Protons kicked outside the, mem the membrane, start the process over, divide and conquer. A new cytochrome C gets a new electron, the new protons get kicked out, and the Q that had gotten reduced now gets fully reduced because it gets a second electron and picks up two protons from the matrix. Okay? That's what's happening in the Q cycle. Okay? Okay. Complex four. Um, is um, a pretty important complex because it's the last complex through which electrons pass before going to oxygen. And as I said earlier, complex four is the only complex that has heme groups that contain copper. The only complex that contains heme groups that contain copper. And of course, heme is a part of a protein. We call that protein a cytochrome. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you briefly how electrons pass through there. It's not quite as complicated as the um, um, uh, Q cycle. Okay. But um, I'm going to step you through it. Here's complex four. All right? Here are, now before I tell you this whole process, I need to tell you what's going to happen. All right? So remember, we're starting with molecular oxygen. That's an O2. At the end of this, we're going to make two H2Os. That means we're going to have to get four protons, and it means we're going to have to get four electrons. All right? Each cytochrome C carries one electron. That means we're going to have to get four cytochrome Cs, and that's why you see two here and two here. Now, this process of bringing electrons in here one at a time probably causes some of the reactive oxygen species that are so hazardous to be formed. Okay? Anytime we do not completely reduce oxygen, we have a reactive oxygen. Oxygen is extraordinarily reactive if it's not fully reduced. Okay? So if we stop this process here after this, 
we've got reactive peroxides. If we stop it um, at where we've gotten too many, where we've got uh, an extra electron somewhere, we might have a superoxide, something that's a real problem. Okay? We don't want to have that. But that's going to be a problem associated with oxidative metabolism. That's why, remember I said, we look at mitochondria that are in old cells versus young cells. We see the mitochondria all beat up. Probably happens because of reactive oxygen species. Now, this is what happens. So let's, let's think about this in some detail. So this is a schematic of the different heme groups uh, that are present in the um, um, complex four. Two cytochrome C's come in, and when those two cytochrome C's come in, each one dumps off an electron, and this guy goes from being in the oxidized form to being in the reduced form. That's what the little red is to designate there. So these guys have each gained one electron. Iron has gone from plus three to plus two. Copper has gone from plus two to plus one. The next step in the process, molecular oxygen comes in. Now, there's not enough electrons there to completely reduce oxygen. So it forms a, what's called a peroxide bridge right here. This peroxide bridge, okay, one side bound to iron, one side bound to copper, guess what? It's taken electrons from each one, and guess what? Those guys have just become oxidized. Then we bring in two more electrons. And as we bring in those two electrons, what happens is we break that peroxide bond. And notice that now we have an iron attached to an OH, and we have a copper attached to an OH. We've brought four electrons in. This guy is fully reduced. The only thing we need now to make molecular water are protons. The protons cleave those bonds, and water is released. Then the process starts all over again. Now, notice that we've got protons and protons that, again, are being taken out of the matrix. We are reducing the concentration of protons in the matrix. And as a consequence, we are changing the concentration of protons relative to the outside, thereby increasing that gradient. There's also, pro there, I should say there is, there are also protons that are pumped in this process. They're not shown on here. But complex, five, complex four is also moving protons outside as well, contributing to that gradient. All right. Let's see. The water is released, I believe, into the matrix. Into the matrix. Yep. Okay. Now, this shows it a little bit better. You see protons now being pumped. You see four protons that are being taken to make water. The difference is, if I have four I take out here, and I put them over there, I've changed the concentration of protons by eight. Minus four here, plus four there. Right? Eight proton change just by that movement right there. Four protons lost here means that we've got a total difference from what we started of 12 protons. So just by the movement of those four electrons, we've changed the proton concentration by 12 over this complex. OK, questions on that before I move on? So there's this lady that goes out and she buys this piano, OK? And she goes to this garage sale. I shouldn't say she buys it. She looks at it, and this is dilapidated old piano, OK? And it looks absolutely like it's beat up, you know, and the, and the guy at the, at the thing says, you know, um, 30 bucks. It's yours, lady, you know? And she says, yeah, I don't know. And she plays it, and it sounds atrocious, you know? She says, ah, oh, I don't know. And he says, I'll tell you what. He says. What you need to do, he said, you need to go find Fred Opernockety. He is the world's greatest piano tuner. Okay? And she says, you know, he says, no, look up in the yellow page. I'm not kidding you, you know? And he works cheap. So she says, what am I out? 30 bucks, right? So she gives the guy 30 bucks. She takes the piano home. 
And she sets it up and she looks in the yellow pages and sure enough, there's Fred Opernoffi, the world's greatest piano tuner. And he's just down the street. So she calls him up and says, I got this piano, I need to have tune. He says, be right there. He comes over and he's got his tools and he, he does a little this, he does a little bit of that. And she sits down and she plays on this piano and it's like a Steinway. She's absolutely astonished. She said, that's amazing. You know, and she pays him a hundred bucks or something for, for the tuning. And she's just happy as she can be. She's got this gorgeous piano now. It sounds incredible. And she can play it and she can have a lot of fun with this thing. Okay? Has anybody heard this joke? Oh, good. Okay. I'm making it up as I go, so. All right. No, I'm not. All right. So she plays the piano for a while. And six months later, this piano's starting to get a little, you know, it's not sounding as good as it was. And she says, ah, I call Fred. So she gets on the Fred, she gets on the phone, she calls up Fred, and he says, hello? And she says, yes. She says, um, I need you to come tune my piano. And he says, oh, your name. And she asks, gives him her name, and he says, that sounds familiar. She said, oh, yes. She says, uh, you tuned this piano for me, she says, um, uh, six months ago, and it was incredible. And he said, oh, he says, I'm sorry. He says, I can't do it. She says, why not? He says, because Opernaka, they only tunes once. <laughs> Opportunity only when you have to explain. <laughs> Opernocity only. To... I should have stayed with biochemistry. I never should have tried this. Okay, I'll just stop telling jokes. Is that, is that better? I'll just stop. All of it, my feelings are hurt. I'm very sensitive, okay? <laughs> All right, let's move on to something not quite so funny, all right? Uh, but probably more important, okay? And the more important thing is an enzyme that is a fascinating enzyme. It's an enzyme called superoxide dismutase. Superoxide dismutase. Now, superoxide dismutase, uh, we have several of them in our cells. So we have different forms of the enzyme and so forth. And superoxide dismutase has long been known to be important in protecting against damage caused by reactive oxygen species. Now, I said earlier you can form superoxide by electron transport, and that's really not true unless you have an accident or something where an electron gets dumped onto an oxygen where it shouldn't. Okay? But suffice it to say that what the, what the enzyme does is it converts superoxide, which is this guy right here. It's an O2 with an extra electron. It converts superoxide into a safer form, in this case, molecular oxygen. Now, this, is, this enzyme is of importance because without it, we are much more prone to oxidative damage. And one of the human diseases that's known to involve a problem with this enzyme is um, Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Okay, There's a genetic form of the disease, and there's a non-genetic form of the disease. And at least in the case of the genetic form of the disease, it's known that this enzyme it has mutated and it doesn't function properly. That occurs in about 10% of the cases. Dr. Joe Beckman um, in my department, uh, also a member of the Linus Pauling Institute, does research on this enzyme. Okay? And they know a fa uh, a, 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 an amazing number of things about the enzyme, though they still don't have a complete understanding of the disease, the non-genetic form of the disease. Anyway, the way this enzyme works is as follows. What you see um, on the screen, the circles are the enzyme. So M refers to superoxide dismutase. This enzyme, in its mechanism of action, grabs that electron that's extra up here and becomes reduced. That's why it's going from oxidized to reduced. Then the reduced form of the enzyme participates in a second reaction with a second superoxide. And now, instead of taking the electron, it donates the electron to the superoxide. Protons come in, and we form hydrogen peroxide. Okay. This leaves us back in the oxidized form. Now, who can tell me from last term the enzyme mechanism that this enzyme is going through? We talked about different mechanisms of catalysis. Who remembers from last term? The enzyme is going through two different states, back and forth. What? No. 
two different states, back and forth. That's the hint, back and forth. Ping pong. The ping pong mechanism. What's that? No, ping pong. <laughs> I just told you the answer. It's ping pong, the ping pong mechanism. Anybody remember that? You know, we did two. We talked about ping pong. We talked about. Oh, man. No wonder you don't get my jokes. No. The ping pong mechanism, where an enzyme is in one state and it's converted and then it dumps something off, I talked about it with respect to transaminases. Okay. <laughs> All right, that's fine. I give. All right. But suffice it to say, this mechanism is ping pong. The enzyme exists in one state, it exists in a second state. And then it goes back to the first state. So that's why it's called a ping pong mechanism. In any event, okay. Maybe I'm just the crazy one here. The bottom line of this is the concentration of superoxide in the cell is reduced dramatically. Now, one of the places we find this enzyme is in the um, uh, lysosomes and peroxisomes. H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. It itself is fairly reactive as well. But it's not as reactive as this guy is. And this guy can either be used by our immune system to kill cells. One of the things that the, one of the mechanisms that macrophages use is actually killing cells with hydrogen peroxide. The other thing that um, uh, can happen to this is that this can be broken down by an enzyme that we have very abundantly in our cells called catalase, C-A-T-A-L-A-S-E. Catalase can break that down. So what we've done with this enzyme is we've converted something that's very, very reactive, very, very much of a problem to something that's much less of a problem that our other enzymes of the cell can handle. Make sense? Okay. So that's what's up with superoxide. There are other enzymes involved in protecting against reactive oxygen species, but superoxide dismutase is one of the very uh, important ones. When we look at the, um, med uh, I'm sorry, at the medical considerations for reactive oxygen species, we see a very large number of them that have been linked in one form or another to reactive oxygen species. This guy right here, atherogenesis, which is uh, atherosclerosis, plugging of the arteries and so forth, is increasingly being looked at because we now know that inflammation of the arteries is oftentimes leading to things like this and inflammation can happen as a result of reactive oxygen species. And as I've said before, one of the ways of increasing your concentration of react reactive oxygen species is to start smoking. That will definitely do it. Okay? So a real problem right there. Other things associated with it, Parkinson's, okay? uh, muscular dystrophy, um, what else? Um, well, you see, the, you, you can read the rest of them. I won't go through them. But in any event, reactive oxygen species are a problem. It's one of the reasons why research on molecules known as antioxidants is of a lot of interest. It's one of the main focuses of the uh, Linus Pauling Institute here at Oregon State. And antioxidant substances are molecules like vitamin E, like vitamin C, that actually disable reactive oxygen species by reacting with them. So that's of a lot of interest and a lot of health interest um, today. Okay, uh, let's see, where am I? I'm going to just say a word about oxidative phosphorylation that we're going to finish for the day. Now, oxidative phosphorylation goes hand in hand with electron transport. Usually. Now, oxidative phosphorylation is where that potential energy of the proton pumping is converted into ATP. It occurs in the mitochondrial inner membrane, as we saw before. And this figure is very unfortunate. Okay? It's, it's, it's accurate, but it's not, it's, not, um, it's not drawn very well. What we see here is the inner matrix goes here, and then it goes all the way around. Okay? So outside is here, inside is all the way around. It's kind of like it's inverted. All right? Now, electron transport is pumping protons into the intermembrane space. And in the intermembrane space, what's happening is there's a complex called complex 5. It has several names. 
Complex 5 is probably the one you'll remember. That don't confuse it with the electron transport system because it's not part of the electron transport system. It's not part of the electron transport system. However, it is a proton channel. It allows protons to flow through it, and protons really want to flow through it. And when they flow through it, what happens is they turn a little turbine, that little turbine is shown right there, and that turbine generates ATP. So we're converting potential energy from the proton gradient to chemical energy in the form of ATP. And that's what's happening in oxidative phosphorylation. Now, I'll talk in some detail about that next time. It's good time for a three-day weekend. See you guys on Wednesday.